Cincy Reformed, I'm Pastor Brandon, joined with Pastor Zach. We are co-pastors at Westside Reformed Church, a united Reformed Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. And today, you know, we had we just uh, celebrated Ascension Day, and we thought we would maybe come together and just talk about the Ascension and how important it is, because it is one of those things that's just ne- neglected, I think, in much of our Christian thought and even our worship and uh, how we think. Sometimes we... You know, we talk about the resurrection, and we kind of like lump it in somehow, the, the, the ascension and resurrection, where resurrection eclipses the ascension. Uh, but again, those were two distinct things in the history of redemption, two very important things in the history of redemption. And we don't want to uh, kind of gloss over the importance of the resurrection and the ascension, uh, both given the proper place. So maybe, Zach, you can start us off by, you know, what's... Um, why is it important? You know, what's one key f- feature of its importance? Yeah, sure. Well, um, let me f- let's first define what it is. Make sure, in case uh, any listeners might not be quite familiar with it, uh, the ascension. It's noted in the Creed, of course. He ascended into heaven, the Apostles' Creed, and the ascension is the acts of Christ uh, forty days after the resurrection, when he was taken from earth into heaven, and so that translocation. Uh, refers to his human nature. Uh, There's no movement in his divine essence because his divine essence, uh, which he shares with the Father and the Spirit, is by definition omnipresent. It's all everywhere present. So there's no movement going on with the divine essence, but rather it's a movement with respect to his second nature, which the Son alone possesses, with respect to his human nature, his body and blood resurrected from the grave 40 days after the resurrection, then went from earth into heaven where it now remains. And so that's kind of what we want to think about when we're now thinking about the ascension of Jesus Christ. And so I think that when we begin then to think about some of the benefits of it, there's a, a variety of places where we could go here. I think maybe the first I'll hit, I'll hit right now uh, is that when uh, Jesus went from earth into heaven, he was going there to present his blood to the Father. And as he was going up into heaven, he actually raised his hands in a benediction posture, which if you had your Old Testament you know, thinking hat on, takes you back to the book of Leviticus, the Day of Atonement, where the high priest was entering the Holy of Holies and taking the sacrificial blood into the Holy of Holies And that was being accompanied by a benediction posture that he pronounced toward God's people. That's then fulfilled at the time of the ascension because the blood that he presented on the cross, that he offered on the cross, pardon me, then needed to be presented in the Holy of Holies, not the one on earth, but the one that's properly speaking in heaven. And so by going from earth to heaven, that movement, he is entering in as our high priest to then offer up his blood in the very Holy of Holies of God and heaven itself to thereby obtain the propitiation and cleansing for his people and for the age that is to come. So that's one of the first things I'd say about the ascension. What would you like to say, Brandon? I think that, um, you know, Acts chapter 2 talks about how, you know, he, he died He rose, he ascended to the right hand of God, he sends, pours out the Holy Spirit. And so he even says, it's actually good that I go away so that I can send the helper, send uh, the Holy Spirit. Christ is called life-giving spirit. He is endowed with the Holy Spirit and pours out that Holy Spirit upon the church. And it's... um, it, it, it's a great thing that the Holy that the Holy Spirit's empowering the church, and it was indeed a good thing for him not to just remain on earth in his re- resurrected state, but for him to go and sit at the right hand of God the Father, where he might not only rule, but also bless by sending forth his Spirit, empowering the church in her mission, uh, in her evangelism, and making disciples of all nations, and uh, also applying that great work of salvation. You know, as we think about salvation being this Trinitarian act, as God 
choosing and Jesus purchasing and then now the Holy Spirit applying that redemption to the elect in their proper times and generations. And so um, that's just an indispensable aspect, I think, of the application of, of the gospel. Anything else you can think of? Yeah, I think that when we uh, are thinking about Christ's ascension, uh, one of the my favorite places to go is in terms of thinking about the, the consequence of this is the fact that Christ's ascension into heaven is really his entrance into uh, glory and into that eternal state that was offered to the first Adam but never obtained by the first Adam because he sinned instead of obeyed. And so then when we think about Jesus not only being the high priest who goes into heaven, and maybe we can speak in a moment here about his, his uh, enthronement in heaven as, as king, but right now I'd like to think about just simply being second Adam as being one who passes probation throughout his entire life of obedience to the will of God and because he passes probation, he then advances higher than the Garden of Eden and is taken into the place that was foreshadowed by Eden. The, he, he becomes the beginning of the new heavens and the new earth in his very person. And so he becomes that glorified man from whose body and blood then begins to pour out all blessing upon those who are then joined to him those whom he represents, he becomes the man of glory who then begins to share that life and glory with his spiritual progeny. And so really that, uh, that entrance is really that moment of his, his transition from the natural state into the capital S spiritual state, the realm of nature into the realm of glorified uh, nature begun in his person because our second Adam has um, been successful and he's accomplished the very thing that our the first Adam failed to do. Yeah, and, and I think too, um, kind of piggybacking off of that, he's, he, he ascends into heaven and um, sometimes we have a, a bit of a, a gap in our thinking where he ascends into heaven to be at the right hand of the Father and then he's going to come back again in the future and then there's just kind of this time gap, not realizing, well, he's ascending into heaven in order to kind of kick off another phase of ministering to his people in his intercessory work in heaven as he's praying for us, as he's, as he's there in heaven interceding for us daily and so we can draw near to our high priest in heaven every single day. And so there's this present reality of 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 Christ. That's one, one thing I love about the book, book of Hebrews is the book of Hebrews, yes, it does speak about you know, the past and what Christ has done, but it orients us so much to the Christ of present, the Christ, our high priest now in heaven and encouraging us, go to Christ now, draw near to Christ now. Christ can help you now, can nourish you now. And uh, so, you know, I think that the intercession being kicked off by his ascension into heaven and now interceding, I think that's a great um, uh, connecting point that we ought not forget about um, how Christ is with us um, here, here at present. He's better able to do it, isn't he? Because he's in heaven, endowed with his spirit, and he's the glory man. Mm -hmm. And so even better than going to him on earth, mm -hmm. that's why he said it's to your benefit that I go away, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I mentioned a little bit ago his enthronement. This is attached to this because the throne of Christ is not an earthly throne. He's not sitting in the White House. He's not sitting in Buckingham Palace or something like that. But the throne that Christ is given is on Mount Zion, according to Psalm 2. And Mount Zion is properly speaking in heaven. And Christ has gone there as Daniel prophesied in the vision of Daniel chapter 7, he's gone there as one like a son of man, who then, with his ascension, entered into that place to approach the Ancient of Days and to receive the everlasting kingdom, to receive power, dominion, to receive glory. And that's what Christ has then done with that enthronement in heaven. He's our priest, who didn't just present blood, but like Brandon said, continues to make intercession which is catalyzed by the ascension. 
He is the uh, king on, the, on Zion's throne, placed there by the Father. And again, that is brought to fruition by way of uh, the ascension. And we could also say maybe a little bit about how this then means that we are properly speaking in, in a certain way. We are in heaven now. We are in glory Maybe I'll let you take that, Brandon. What do you think? Okay, well, I was going to actually talk about worship and the sacraments okay, I'll go there. and things. Okay, but, um, go for it. Yeah, so, you know, the the ascension calibrates for us even our even our worship now and how we think about various things. And also some, some of the disagreements that we have on earth with our, perhaps, Lutheran brothers and sisters who have a different idea. But, you know, for us, the, the ascension, are, his flesh... The, the you know, our flesh right mm -hmm. is is now in heaven and he kind of paved that way for us but his flesh doesn't doesn't leave heaven right I mean his flesh as we're taking the Lord's Supper for example um, it, he's there spiritually with us but we're not we're not feasting on him physically mm -hmm. but now we are we are lifted into the heavenly places you know throughout the Heidelberg Catechism I was just kind of surprised as I'm reading through the Heidelberg Catechism it's always referring to you know the spirit bringing us to Christ the spirit bringing us to Christ and and you know we are as Paul said we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places um, that's where our citizenship is, and and, and, and and that's where we are. And as we worship, uh, we are lifted into heaven um, to feast upon Christ through word, through sacrament. That is the way in which he nourishes our souls. Not that we bring Christ's flesh down to us at the altar or something like that, but no, the Spirit brings us to uh, Christ in heaven that we feast upon him by faith. And uh, again, I think that just kind of recalibrates our posture. And as we're going to church, uh, calibrated to the ascension of Christ, that we're lifted with him, feasting upon him spiritually. Anything else I can unpack? There? Yeah, well, I mean, I think on that one, though, really helpful at the time where I was kind of thinking of going is that the Spirit is, is lifting us there, like you said, to feast upon Christ. And there's a very real sense in which we're already there, right? Mm, sure. There's a very real sense in which our, we are positioned there mm -hmm. because Adam is there, our second Adam. And because we're joined to him and we are in a very real sense in him, that we are already there and that we belong more there than we belong here. We belong more to the future than we belong to the present. We're more of a new creation than we are of an old creation. And that that's the kind of reality that the Holy Spirit is bringing about in our lives, which is why then we can be charged by Paul to seek the things that are above rather than the things that are on earth. Because our life is hidden with Christ and God. Mm. And that life that's there hidden, that's our life, not here. Our life that's there hidden will then be revealed one day when Christ is revealed. Mm -hmm. And so really, I think a beautiful way of thinking about the fact that, you know, we might have beautiful things on earth. We might be given in a stewardship over, um, uh, you know, things that are of earthly value and we give God thanks for that. But that's not our life. Um, our life is stored up. And because the life that we have in glory far transcends, far outweighs, far overshadows anything we can even conceive uh, on this earth. So, yeah, I think that that kind of recalibration of where our life is and then who we are. It's all about the ascension that takes us there, that, that moves our life from this age to the age to come, moves our life from earth to glory, and then just reshapes how we view ourselves and how we view what, what we value at that point in time too. Mm. And, and picking up there too, um, it's interesting to think now about, you know, for example, evangelism or doing apologetics and defending Christianity, uh, given the ascension and given our place in heaven. Um, William Dennison, he was talking about doing apologetics with the view of the ascension. And, you know, he said, we're not, it, it's not us on earth pointing people to heaven, right? It's us in heaven saying, come up here with me. 
Uh, so it kind of recalibrates as we're talking to those outside of Christ. We're saying, "Hey, come up with us, right? We're not we're not like some in some like third realm. Like, hey, you need to go up there, but hey, no, we're here with Christ, and you need to be with us with Christ in the heavenly places." And so I, th- I think it just kind of postures us differently as we engage unbelief, be it through evangelism or apologetics. It's a very victorious posture, isn't it? Mm-hmm. We we're, have a, an episode coming out soon about uh, post-millennialism, whether that comes out before or after this one, I don't really know. But the point being, though, that oftentimes, because we're not post-millennial, we can be accused of being you know, pessimistic or something like that. Like, no. The ascension is the posture of glory and victory. It's just not what the world thinks of as glory and victory because the, the glory and victory are found in Christ, mm-hmm. not within our earthly um, circumstances. And so as we think about this, it, I think it really puts wind in your sails uh, as a Christian to say that it's, this is not my home. My home is above. I'm seated above in the heavenly places with Christ where I've been raised up and seated. And so to your point about evangelism and about the excitement of welcoming people into this very same reality in which we partake by faith in order that in the future they can join us partaking with it uh, by sight is a really, uh, I think, a really exciting um, proposition. In Acts chapter 1 and 2, it, um, it loops in uh, a helpful expectation of the return of Christ. Um, so, you know, the angel says, you know, as you saw him go up, you will see him come down, right? And so I think the ascension does kind of uh, help us to be eager, I think, mm-hmm. about that uh, about that return of Christ. And it, there, there's certain parallels that, you know, that, that uh, you could draw there. Um, you know, the, 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 the disciples, for example, were perhaps not, not, not anticipating that he was going to go up on a cloud at that moment. Uh, but think about as as he returns you know he's going to return at a time perhaps when um we're not prepared or we're thinking you know we're thinking it's just a quote-unquote normal day and we're getting we're getting married and we're going to bed and we're brushing our teeth going off to work and and christ will return in the same way that he went up and so it helps us i think to have a healthy expectation to be ready uh to be eager to meet with christ the one uh he ascended we ascended spiritually Spiritually with him, um, and that's where our citizenship is. And now we're expecting that bodily return to see him in the flesh. Where um, yes, he's enthroned now, but he's going to, as uh, Meredith Klein says, uh, this this world will be will be heavenized as as Christ comes back into the in, in the uh, f- future to to call his people home. And so um, yeah, I think the the ascension helps us, kind of orients us toward the. Well, the uh, theologian J.G. Davies uh, described the ascension as the line in the creed that's been most neglected by Christians and most poorly understood and poorly appreciated. And we hope that this episode has gone a little way toward helping to correct that in, in your life and our lives as we think about appreciating the fullness of what Christ has done and also the fullness of what he is continuing to do. Actually, I thought that's where you're going to go when you're start, starting to talk about Acts 1. Mm. Because he talks about all the things that Christ did until he was taken up yeah. into glory. But it's the fact that Christ is still at work. And the ascension um, catalyzes that work by the Spirit that we then see at Pentecost. And so being mindful then that, uh, that the ascension of Christ matters uh, not only for what he did, but what he's continuing to do, and then like you just mentioned, as what he's going to do uh, with his second coming in in the future. Uh, Praise be to Christ. We hope this has been helpful for you, and we hope you join us next week. Uh, For Brandon, I'm Zach. This is the Cincy Reform Podcast. We are sponsored by Westside Reform Church. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.